man of the hour. His own views were simple and did not alter. If the Germans are beaten, they will accept any terms. If they are not beaten, I do not wish to make terms with them. Wilson lost no time in putting German intentions to the test. He asked whether the German and Austrian governments were prepared to accept the peace program which he had delivered to the United States Congress in January 1918, a program known as the 14 Points. It was an unfortunate criterion. Britain, depending on sea power, looked askance at the clause which insisted on absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas in peace and in war. Proposals for altering the frontiers of Europe, which seemed straightforward enough in Washington, took on a different look when seen from Paris or Rome. Wilson had not consulted the Allies before replying to Germany. And now, for the Allies, the war seemed a little less promising than it had in October's early days. In Flanders, drenching rain had halted the Belgian and British advance. The Americans, in the Argonne, also faced insoluble transport problems. The French army fought hard, but the men of 1918 were not the dashing soldiers of 1914 and 1915, and the memory of the mutinies of 1917 was not likely to fade in the mind of their commander, General Pétain. He could not press them too hard. The burden of the advance fell upon the British army. Against it, the Germans summoned up their last reserves of courage, skill and fortitude. All of these they possessed in a rare degree. British had been within three miles of Cambrai on September the 27th. They didn't enter the burning city until October the 9th. Yet the British Army also possessed reserves of fortitude and courage. On October the 17th, they attacked again on the River Sel, capturing 20,000 prisoners and 475 guns. By the end of October, their own losses in this offensive had been as heavy as any that they had sustained throughout the war. The British Army, Haig told the government on October the 19th, was never more efficient than it is today but it has fought hard and it lacks reinforcements. With diminishing effectives, morale is bound to suffer. The French and American armies are not capable of making a serious offensive now. The British alone might bring the enemy to his knees. But why expend more British lives? And for what? Around the whole perimeter of the war, the Central Powers faced disaster. In Syria, 
the city of Damascus had been taken on October the 1st. Aleppo was captured on the 26th. On the 30th, Turkey asked for an armistice. Allied forces advancing from Salonika now stood on the Danube. On October the 24th, the Italians had launched their final offensive against Austria. By the end of the month, Austrian resistance had collapsed. Austria surrendered on November the 3rd. Now, Germany stood quite alone to face her agonizing moment. She had no choice. She had to accept whatever terms she was offered. A semi-official newspaper wrote, There will be a moment of passionate rebellion against the terms. Then we shall have to say to ourselves that we have the right to die ourselves, but not the right to let others die, that our business is to prevent useless bloodshed, and that further bloodshed has become really and obviously useless. A socialist leader summed it up, Better a terrible end than terror without end. Germany faced the truth with racking despair. November came and a Munich paper bitterly recalled the Kaiser's promise in August 1914 that the army would be home when the leaves fall. When the leaves fall. Many are now dead who thought that they would be at home when the leaves fall. Who does not remember with pain those cheerful words of the Kaiser? The leaves are now falling for the fifth time. Now perhaps peace will come. The signs of internal commotion in Germany are growing more numerous and more serious. Want and the utter collapse of all the expectations of victory and plunder have evidently excited very dangerous passions among the masses. The people of Cologne are sick of the war. They say they've been grossly deceived. They were told the war would bring them prosperity, whereas it has brought them nothing but misery. By November the 6th, there was revolution in all parts of Germany. Mutinous sailors from the fleet at Kiel took over Hamburg and Bremen. There were insurrections in Hanover, Brunswick, Cologne and Munich. Berlin was in ferment. Ludendorff had resigned on October the 27th. Now his successor told the government, We shall have to cross the lines with a white flag. Even a week is too long to wait. The next day, November the 7th, the German Armistice Commission crossed the lines. The last days of the war were at hand. The last shells were being fired, the last attacks mounted, the last killing was being done. From first to last, the price of war was fearful. The poet, Wilfred Owen, who had written in his poems one of the sternest indictments of war, was only one of the many who fell during these last days. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, 
You would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. It is sweet and glorious to die for one's country.